there are subjects which lend themselves to radio, if you like, which don't need the demonstrations that we do with all the tool tests and everything else. One of those that's very, very close to Robin's heart, if you like, is the subject, the really thorny subject of pricing jobs, because there's a lot of very, very competent tradesmen out there yeah. who really come unstuck because they end up working for nothing. They end up working for wages sometimes yeah. because they're not good businessmen a lot no. of the time and they just need a little bit of help. Now, I know you've got some real strong views on this whole yeah, subject. Yeah, I do. So, um, I've learned through experience. I've been in business since I was 18 years old. I'm 48 now. Do the maths yourself. And so I've only learned through painful experience. I've done everything that Roger said there. I've underpriced jobs. I've not priced a job properly. I've come unstuck. Um, and it's quite painful. And anyone in the business will know if you if you start feeling like you're losing money on a job, your interest goes, and it's towards the end of the job, and you want to get a finished job and all the rest of it, and your clients start getting up uns, upset with you and all the rest of it, it's just not a good place to be. So what I'm going to tell you is a couple of little tips you can take away with you, and these should help you in your everyday working life. So in no order, but what I'm going to tell you is this. First of all, manage expectations. Now that can be as simple as answering your phone. Okay, if you see a phone number and you think, oh, I don't want to talk to them now, pick the phone up, tell them you're too busy to talk now, but I'll ring you back later. That's the first step. The second step is, if you're not interested in the job, say, I'm so sorry, I'm not interested in the job, but maybe try me again in the future. So just start knocking out all the stuff that you don't really want to do. So you get to the point where you are interested in pricing the job, First things first, why are you pricing it? Are you pricing it because you're desperate or you're pricing it because it's what you enjoy doing? If you don't enjoy doing it, just don't bother pricing it if you can afford not to do the work. So you've found a job you want to do and you think, yeah, I really want to get this job. You're standing in front of the client. It could be a trade customer or it could be a member of the general public, which is what I have a lot of experience with, working with the general public. So what you need to do is you need to gauge them and you need to price condition them. So turn up on time if possible. See, you know, see how the land lies. Is it, does the does the person look tidy? If they're tidy, the chances are the bank balance will be tidy too. It's <laughs> a great one. It's so true. Amount of times I've been to an untidy house and they've been terrible payers, right? So I know oh, there's really? a lot. To, yeah, there's a lot to be said right. for that. So you want the job. But and they they were asking you all these questions. You're trying to make a few mental notes. They might say to you, "Oh, we want all the guttering done and and fascia," and they're not explaining it. They're laymen. They really don't know what they're talking about. They know they think they know what they want, but they don't. So you're going to say to them, "Okay, price condition them at this point. See the colour of their pupils and just say, "I've done a job very similar to this, and it was X amount of pounds." and see what their reaction is. If we get a reaction which is, okay, how long will it take you to get me a written estimate? Somehow you know they're interested at that price. And then you can go home, you can think that estimate through, you think, yep, I know that they're interested around this price. Now, you're gonna list that work out nice and clearly, remove old guttering, cart away and dispose of. Put safe access up. Go and buy the new guttering well, and so on and so forth. And you're gonna list out everything you're going to do for the money. Okay, now now my my experience is that I, I've always avoided giving them a price on, on the day. Yeah. Right? They say, well, how much, how much? And I say, I don't know. And they say, give us a ballpark figure. I say, I really yeah. don't want to give you a ballpark figure. Now, the reason that I've avoided it over the years is because when I give them a ballpark yeah. figure, that figure is in their head. Yeah. Now, if I go away and I think, oh, God, I forgot this, I forgot that, I've got to add this, yeah. and it ends up saying being 500 quid more, yeah. and I go back to them and say, you know the ballpark figure I gave you, £2,000? It's now 2500 yeah. And they go, oh, really? So I, I think it builds a little bit of disappointment sometimes. Well, I mean, I have the, I, I totally disagree with you on that one yeah. because um, I've, I've won jobs of two, three hundred thousand pounds yeah, yeah. based on price conditioning purely because you get a feel for your trade. Once you know your trade, if you're a chip in, you hang doors all day long, mm. you know how much you're worth, you know how much it costs yeah, to hang yeah. a door. Yeah, okay. yeah? And so it's very similar if you're building extensions. You can look at something and just in the back of your mind, you've got a seventh sense, you're thinking that's 45,000 quid, that job. The skill of it then is making sure you describe what you're going to do for that sort of money. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. You can't, you can't say it's 45 grand and by the way, I'm going to throw your kitchen in because they haven't asked you about the kitchen. <laughs> so you just 
Give okay, it I, I understand. I, 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 I do agree. I mean, you know, the proof's in the pudding. You've been successful, goodness knows. You've got plenty of work, so you can't be doing anything wrong there. So it must be right. But, but it's just, for me... I always got this thing of like over the years when I priced a job and they come back and they say, Yeah, we want you to do it. And I think, Oh, does that mean I'm the cheapest? And I'm worried. I'm worried until I do the job because I'm thinking, What have I forgotten? Why did I end up being the cheapest? So I moved away from that whole thing of pricing. In other words, somebody phoned me up and they say, You know, are you the plumber? And they say, How much? And as soon as I start that conversation with how much, I'm off. I don't want to know. So, where did you get me from? How did you get me? You got me from a recommendation. Yeah. I did a job for a friend of yours. Now I'm in the, the I'm into it. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to him. Before that, if they're just phoning up to get three estimates, four estimates, some of them were five estimates, and I've got to waste my time going around every. Well, that's exactly of the week, that's exactly why jobs, that's exactly why when I'm face to face with someone and I have a chat with them. It's about relationships. If you yeah. feel comfortable with someone, that's a good start. Yeah. If the people, you know, have got, if you've been recommended to them, that's a good start. Or equally, if they've been recommended to you, that's Absolutely. a good start. Absolutely, you need that. And I really do think that the price conditioning is really, it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of aggravation for them as well. And quite often, I've stood there face to face with someone, I said, this roof conversion is going to be 25 grand. And they said, well, we've had a price of 15. And I said, you need to have a look at what's involved for 15,000 because from my experience and you've seen what we do we could not do that job for 15,000 yeah, quid yeah. and then it puts um, most people I work for a professional or at least more professional than me that's why they can afford to have work done on their houses because they're lawyers or doctors or professionals people who bother yeah. to go to school unlike me yeah. so I do really think they appreciate that level of um, yeah yeah you know yeah, no it's good I mean as I say your your method works for you but I think that the, the thing you overlook is that the people buy from people they like yeah? yeah so if they like you and they do tend to like you then they think this is a chap now you put all those things into the hands of somebody else who's a bit rough around the edges who goes in there and it's just like and they they do your spiel if you like, and they go and they go right. I've done a similar job to this. It's going to be twenty five thousand pounds, and that's the only I know. So, and then it, that, none of that works, does it? Because the, you've got you've got to somehow chime in with the empathy. I know, so, know but so but, being a salesman, you're, but there's you're a, a natural mar- salesman. There's a market. There's a market for those guys, and there's a market for people like me. I've I've been there and done that sort of stuff where you sort of go up, look at a job, say, "Yep, yeah, look all keen, go away." You're so busy. You get a phone call in a week's time. They say. Oh, how are you getting on with my estimate? Yeah, it's nearly done. Just got to type it up. You haven't even yeah, started yeah. to look at it. Oh, no. And then a week goes by, then you get a phone call. How are you getting on? Yeah, it's in the post. And you haven't even put it in the post. And that's a horrible place to be because yeah. you spend every day worrying about, oh, my God, I should have done, done that. If you, you stand in front of someone, you price condition them, you use your experience. If you know your subject, you know how much things it's going to cost roughly. Okay, I'm not saying you, you, drop, a, you know, drop a clanger by any standards. That's not the name of the game. The name of the game is this. Okay. So let me let me tell you about simple pricing. There's the way of time and materials, okay? So you've got to make an estimate of how long you think it's going to take to do something. Then you've got to allow variables. What about the weather if you're working outside? You need to have done a calculation. That for every, if you're going to do 200 working days a year, which is roughly what we get doing a five-day week, you're going to lose 25 days a year to bad weather at least if you're working outside. So your your prices per day for the 175 that you work need to reflect those 25 you're not working. Mm. So you might think, well, uh, it's 200 pound, 200 pound a day, but it's actually not. It's 220 pound a day is what you should be charging because you need to be allowing mm. for those rainy days. Yeah. Okay, And also, coming back to day work, for example, Never get bogged down on day work if you can't because people clock watch when you're doing day work. They think we own you from 8 o'clock till 5 o'clock and we want to watch you for every minute that you're there doing that. And now as a craftsman, there's so many variables. Sometimes you've got to sit and think, ponder, think, sharpen your tools, fiddle in your van. You've got to do this sort of stuff. It's all part of getting the job done. But to a client looking out the window thinking he's in his van again, what's he doing? When's he going to start nailing up a thing? They haven't got a clue about what's going on. And because they think they're owning you for the day on that money... So what you're saying is don't do that, thing. I'm thinking that you should always, always try to be on a price, mm. OK? You should have a start, 
and a finish. Yeah. Well, you never yeah. make any money out of day work, no. do you? Really, not you, any, not any profit as such. You make wages. Yeah. So you've got to say. So I'm telling you, basically, as a price of job, you're a bricklayer. You're going to build a wall. You know, it's three thousand bricks. There's a few piers in it. There's a bit of undulation. It goes uphill here. You think to yourself, well, it's three thousand bricks. I can lay eight hundred bricks in a day. Divide that. That's four days. Okay, four days times two hundred, eight hundred pound. There's no profit in it. Well, that's just your wages. You could go and work for someone for that. What if it rains? What if the client turns up and says, actually, I don't like the shade of bricks that you've got there. We need to change them. And so, okay, so there's, you've lost a week before the bricks get changed over. All of a sudden, what are you going to fill your time with that week? It's, it's, there's no margin for error. You should be making a profit. When you go to Sports Direct and you buy a T-shirt, Mike Ashley wants to make 100% on that T-shirt. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're a business. You're, you're there to make money. Well, I'm not saying you should be charging £400 a day because the industry doesn't command that. But what you should do on a price is say, I'm going to build that wall for you. I'm going to deliver it exactly how you want it to be. I'm, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm going to give you a price. That's one price you're going to pay whether it rains or not. I'm going to get that job done for you. And instead of charging them four days at £200, you're going to talk them about how you're going to mix the mortar, what you're going to use, how you're going to lay the bricks, how you're going to clean up after yourself, how you're going to make sure all the rubbish is clear from the site, all the things that the clients don't even think about. All they can see is the finished brick wall. But there's lots more that goes into it, okay, your organisation time. And you're going to talk that price up to something where a, a businessman would be. And the client, what's it worth to the client as well? A new wall around their house, they spent 500 grand on that house. A wall around that house is worth a lot of money to them, especially in their mind. You've got to paint a picture. Although you're right, 500 grand house, fine. You know, you're dealing with a lot of people who are, let's, let's face it, city, city guys, they're multi-millionaires, right? So let's look at a guy working up in Rochdale, and I only mention yeah. Rochdale just as an example, not because there's anything about Rochdale, but right. let's say they're not going to pay that money. So the guy's saying, look, if I charge, and I've had this with plasterers going, if I charge any more than £130 a day, a competition, you. there's so many plasterers around here, I'm not going to get any work. Yeah, and all I'll say to that, Roger, is that they'll always be doing that all no, I'll no. say to you is that they need to aspire to think how can I make or how can I earn more money and what is it that I have to do what steps have I got to take in my work in life to make sure I don't feel like I'm not earning enough money because I know carpenters who are pretty rubbish but they earn bloody good money because they're excellent salespeople. Mm. okay they are really good at selling themselves. And the general public doesn't really know what's a good hung door or a bad hung door if it sh shuts and opens. Whereas yeah, I'll look yeah. at it and go, God, you can fit a 50p up there, you can fit a penny down there. And also, this come here's a really good point about you know demographics or areas yeah, and all yeah, the rest yeah. of it and yeah. the market rates and market hmm. forces. So that's why people do travel. Okay, that's why we've seen an influx of Eastern Europeans because they know that they can come here and earn minimum wage, which is a fairly good wage in relation to what they're going to get back in yeah. Poland or something like that. So what I'm saying is, when I was an apprentice in 1988, I was working with a lot of guys from Liverpool. They were travelling down on a Monday morning going back on a Friday night because there was no work in Liverpool yeah, yeah. and they were coming all the way down south so this is exactly what's happening yeah. so you just have to go where it is don't you I've been, I've been working up in Liverpool two years I spent working up in Liverpool <laughs> I, used to pass, I used to pass people on the motorway I think I wonder if they go down to London yeah, yeah. I think we can swap the same jobs job. yeah, 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 yeah you can swap jobs no, so funny. no I do, I do think though we're, as, um, as you said at the beginning we're mm. crafts people, not business people. And I think that's really true. But if you are self-employed, like the majority of people are, no one really wants to employ you in this industry because it's just easier to sort of say, oh, sorry, it's yeah. easy come, easy go. Yeah. What you need to do is think of yourself. You've got to have a little goal. You've got to think, all right, I'm earning 120 quid a day now, but by the end of the year, I want to be making 150. Okay. And you've got to have little steps. So what the first step is, how am I going to do that? Well, you're going to find different types of work. What do you enjoy doing best? You're going to try and look for that type of work. How am I going to get that kind of work? I like being mm. kitchens, but I never get kitchens to fit. Have you ever walked into a kitchen showroom and said, I'm a brilliant kitchen fitter and I'm available? No, you probably wait till the phone rings. You need to go into the kitchen showroom. Mm. You need to make yourself available. You need to say, I've been fitting kitchens for the trade for all these years and now I'm available to help you. And they'll break your arm off. 
It's as simple as that. And then you can't fit kitchens anyway, can you, with a broken arm? No. Once they break your arm off, you obviously you need a friend. Listen, I interject here. We'll do a bit of question time here. We had a young lad contact us through Facebook, and he's trying. He's finding it hard to get a toe in in the industry. Right. And he said he's being undercut. So it sounds like he's in a bit of a race to the bottom. What would you advise him? Uh, I think it's a real problem, OK? And it, it has been a race to the bottom for the last 15 years. And the last five years have been pretty, pretty hard. And why? Anyone, why is that? Why is it a race to the bottom? Because there's a lot of labour available out there, Roger. And also there's a lot of mean people who want to pay nothing for something. Yeah, and it really, really, really breaks my heart the fact these young guys trying to come into the industry now, 17, 18, you need to get the experience. But if you can't get the starts, you can't get the experience, and it just kills their confidence. Yeah? yeah, so for the guy who's trying to get a toe in, look, you need to network. You need to, you know, even if you've got some mates at the pub and some's a builder, you've got to say, look, can I do a bit of weekend work? Have you got anything here? You've got to put yourself out there. You've got to try and offer your services. You might have to kiss a few frogs before you meet the odd prince, but that's all I can say you can do. It's a bit of a struggle. It's a really difficult industry, but a really rewarding one at the same time. Well, I, my my view of this right, is that I, I used to talk to a lot of plumbers. I used to go around doing the Institute of Plumbing talks, and I'd say to guys, how many nights are you spending going out estimating pricing jobs? Four nights a week, some of them. That's, that's horrendous. After after working all day long, they go out in the evening to price a job. How many of those jobs are you actually getting? One in four, right? So that means three nights a week they're going out for nothing, wasting their time doing this. So I'd say to them, this is my thing, is if all you're trying to do is beat the price of the other guy that's walked in the door, you're wasting your time. And I wouldn't even begin on that. If you can't engage with that customer and start selling them something else other than price, 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 if there's not some way that you can that you can say to them, what I'm going to do for you, and not slagging the other guys off, but just, just show them that there's something other than the money. I went to one of these American business guru guys where he was giving a, a talk, very impressive, and he said, and it was to plumbers and so on, and he said, you guys... You'd be better off if you never saw 50% of your work. And they went, oh, and you could see it around everyone's gasp, you know, sharp intake of breath. And, you know. and he said, no, 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 come on, think about it, think about it. You know, you. And, and the more you thought, actually, yeah, that job I did, that I didn't actually make very much money out of that, that kept me from doing another job that, you know, the phone rang and I had to turn down a better job. So there is, there is something to be said for for absolutely just turning away and, and that when you start out that's really hard to do isn't it i used to go up to every single job when the phone rang i was out there regardless you know after a while you get confident enough to say i don't want to do that that's not for me i'm not going to make any money out of it and, and your point you said to me some time ago i remember this you said to me right the first thing i ask how am I going to make money out of it? Yeah. Yeah? And that, that's fantastic because that really stuck with me. I thought, that's, that's the thing I ask in the end. I do the job yeah, and then yeah. I think, right, how am I going to make money? Yeah. Too late, too bloody late. Yeah, you really do. And you need to focus on that. So you need to sort of, as I said to you before, you need to see the colour of people's eyes. You need to say, I feel that this project could be worth X amount of pounds. Yeah. And then you need to, if, when they show some interest, you need to go away, you need to do a really detailed estimate stroke specification of exactly what your interpretation of their information, whether it's verbal, whether it's from drawings, you're going to write all that down, and then you're going to come up with another figure. And the figure is going to reflect your work that you put into it. And if you do it on a spreadsheet, you can list it all out in the spreadsheet. The next thing you do, by the side there, you have a simple add-up column, and you go through every single bit of job you think okay 60 pounds you show them that spreadsheet or you not? could table that spreadsheet but generally speaking I never table a spreadsheet because that's my figures because yeah, okay. when you table a spreadsheet someone might turn around and go well, just remove that item and this item and what they don't realise is you've priced oh, it no, as a yeah. job going through yeah, yeah. So if you take out that item actually you're not taking out that item's going to affect that and that and that's going to yeah. put the price up of this and this and this it's just too complicated for the clients okay see. that's fair enough so yeah. you've got a spreadsheet you've listed it out you've got a column which is adding up you come to the bottom and you've got your core costs and then you've got to think to yourself okay what about if he tells me in six months that he wants me to do the work? How will the prices have changed? So you need to explain to the client that this is valid for two or three months and that mm. needs to reflect the fact that prices, materials and labour yeah, yeah, go up. Yeah. You've also got to look at your prices and think to yourself, is there any margin on that for my error? 
you yeah. know, what if I do yeah, yeah, have a cock up? Yeah. So in a, a in, in a separate column, you could add a percentage. You could put like a five percent. They would call that sod's law. Yeah, margin for error, and you could also put in some profit, for example, if no. you think well, yeah. these prices are my sort of labour and material core prices. But I really would love to earn ten percent profit. So you've gone on from you've done your schedule, you've tabled that to the client, you've given him a total cost, and you 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 now probably comes to a little bit more than you might have said initially. But he was expecting that because how can anybody stand there and look at something and realise exactly well, what yeah, it's going to cost? Know, but okay? that's why I don't say anything. That's why I say I'm going to go away and consider it. But you, but by 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 standing in front of the guy. By giving him a figure, you're seeing the colour of his eyes. If he straight away goes, forget about it, you think, oh, well, I thought it was worth that. So actually, I'm not wasting my time. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Um, thanks yeah. so much for seeing me. It's been really nice meeting you. Move on to the next job. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Instead of going away and then doing exactly what I'm talking about, spending three or four weeks of spare time trying to come up with a price. Oh, that's horrible. It's horrible. And then in turn around and say, you're way out, mate. And what does he know that you're way out? You've just gone to the trouble. Do you know what? That's the one that makes me laugh is the one I've been in and um, say, say it was a bathroom I'm doing, you know, and I've gone in there and I said, right, it's going to be 15 grand. You go, oh, that's a lot more than I thought. So what would you think? I said, oh, I thought it was going to be 10. Based on what? Yeah. Based on the fact that that's all you wanted to yeah. pay. But they wanted to borrow, that's yeah. what your friend has paid yeah. down the road. But it's not based on anything. No. At all, and and that that's incredible to shift people off that thing of like they've just got a wish thing. I wish I could get a yeah. bath and done for ten grand. Exactly. So so one of my next golden rules or golden tips to anybody is you you tell them exactly what you're going to do, and then you tell them what you aren't going to do. You might think, well, what do you mean what I'm not going to do? So in in our industry, there's lots of associated work. So for example, if someone was hiring my labour to build a roof structure. I will tell them that I'm going to build the roof structure for them. I'll also tell them I'm not going to insulate it. I'm not going to put roof coverings of any sort on it. I'm not going to supply any scaffolding of any sort. Yeah? God, you're a miserable git, aren't you? And because, <laughs> because I've learned from experience on, that I've priced the roof, I've dr- I said, we're ready for you. I've, dr- I've driven up and there's no scaffolding there. And I say, well, the scaffold's not up. They say, well, well, I thought you'd supply that. Oh, no, no, we don't supply that. And then straight away they're unhappy because you know what building a roof is but they don't know what building a roof is so you've got to tell them what you're not going to do and you've got to tell them nicely so you can say this is what I'm, this is the information you give me this is what I'm going to do it's different if they said oh and also include for the bathrooms and include for the tiling then you've got to go back to them and say what exactly do you want in the bathrooms because if you price a bathroom and you think oh I think they'd like this and this and this forget it you're never going to get it right they're always going to want something different unless they're a clone of yourself of course which is quite unusual oh, so I've then, seen a few around mate so you've got your, you've, you've established your specification or your estimate your list of works you've established what you're not going to do so you're clear about where you finish yeah. okay you've also said to them half past four I'm going to need to be paid as I go along I'm going to need a little bit of material money up front potentially and then I would like to be paid weekly to to which they say weekly? I thought you'd want to do it in stage payments well that's great if you can afford to bankroll someone's building work the chances are you can't you've got to be paid weekly you just say I'm going to tell you on a Tuesday what you need to pay me by Friday so here's my invoice or here's my note Here's my bank account details, and then you expect to see it on the bank on Friday. If they don't pay you in the bank on Friday, then you've got to realise that they're probably not going to carry on paying on time in the future. Most of your bills coming out, you've got to pay. maybe you've got a few helpers and you've got to pay them weekly as well. So the last thing you want to do is start bank rolling work because it gives you a bit, a bit of uncomfort. You might have to use an overdraft facility, which is expensive, and you've got the bank breathing down your neck. So it's really good to keep those invoices going out weekly on a Tuesday. That's a good point because they do say that stage payment thing has always been a bit that's got me was they say if you get the first payment fast you never get the last. Yeah, you know, I just and they always sucker you by giving you that first payment. You know, all these yeah, people are really good payers, aren't yeah. they? And then somehow, when you get to the last no. one, it's all those snaggings, yeah, and they just keep finding reasons yeah. for not paying you. What I find is it keeps people very focused on the job in hand when they're mm. paying weekly because if you've got an issue or a problem, they're more likely to respond to it because it might yeah. have an impact on the price. And yeah. because what you also do, let's say you are doing a little work, you're a decorator, say, and you're painting 
in a room and some of the walls just starts falling off it's got to be replastered and you've you've tried to contact him on his phone and you think oh um, you really need to talk to him and say look we do need to get a plasterer here it's going to cost you 180 pounds for his day's money and we need to and can you is that okay with you and he's and you haven't had the conversation but you've called your plasterer mate anyway he's come in and done it and the guy said well i know a plasterer and you didn't need to do that i'm not paying you for it you know it's things like that so point is you need to get those little extras agreed so you can have good communication with your clients say i may need to talk to you at any time if there's a problem because otherwise i might have to stop and if i have to stop you you've got to pay me for standing around hmm. yeah so anyway so you you add those extras on if there's an extra and that goes on that week's money all right so it's not on a total you add it onto that week's money and you generally find it works really well and if someone's not prepared to pay you weekly and you're prepared to work there every single day of the week i don't think that's fair yeah no All no you're asking I mean, them to do is make one bank transaction absolutely yeah okay, there's I don't a lot think it's of fair. if you're prepared to give someone that. 50 hours a week why can't they give you 15 minutes to make a payment to you mm. no no yeah no, absolutely is that fair yeah yeah i've found that very interesting obviously i've talked to you before about these subjects so it's not all new to me but every time there's a little bit of a change in what you're saying there's something else almost like you're building on your experience over the years now if you had a son yeah would you be encouraging your son to go into the building industry it's a really really interesting question in the right format I would so for example if it was the right trade if he was going to be an electrician for example because the electrical works is much more regulated the colleges are still training really well and the conditions of work are generally better you're not outside all the time are you you're only out doing the outside lights once a week if you're lucky or something like that carpentry possibly bricklaying definitely not tough industry but mm, it's a difficult one it's a really good question though Roger because um, I've been asked that before yeah um, well you've got you, you've known people who've got very rich Builders who've got yeah. very rich, builders have built their own houses and done very yeah. well on it. It's a unique opportunity for people who say haven't got the best education in the world, you know, they're not great academically, but have been able to make a fantastic living just yeah. by what they can do, their talents and their, their yeah. by their hands. But yeah. but I, you know, none of my kids are in it in the building yeah. industry. They don't show any signs of wanting to join it and in a way it pains me to say but I'm not that sorry. But if but, I did if I did have a son and he showed interest in the building trade. I tried to get him to do something like engineering mm, or really? architecture, yeah, something like that, well, with a view to doing a bit of trade stuff as well on the side. Really? Because I just think that... you get him to join the dark side, would you? Yeah, Arch- I would. Architects. I think that, well, I don't know many architects that are poor, to be fair. <laughs> That's it. He rests his case there. Okay, so that's a good place to end this podcast. We're going to have more coming up in the future. Let us know what you think, because if we're not, if we're, you know, preaching to the converted or the deaf or whatever, we'd like to know. All right, see you again soon. Yeah, thanks for joining us.